the black void where my power supply is supposed to be. His computer crashed. I'm thinking it's the power supply. I can't be sure, but that's my guess. But the really irritating thing is, is, is last time I had to buy power supplies, I bought two. So I have a brand new extra one somewhere, and I can't find it. <sighs> so, so it's, you know, I hate that shit. I can find, I found every dead power supply I've ever had. So I found like five dead power supplies that I kept for unknown reasons. We always figure there might be, oh, I need five volts for something, or something might still work. I mean, I think it's just a three volt that's fried on this one. This is, you know, the computer does absolutely nothing. It just runs like it normally runs, but it doesn't beep or do anything in post. So I'm just saying, the only thing that can be is the CPU has to be out or something. Anyway, the three, <clears throat> three volt line or whatever. So, it's my guess. It doesn't matter. Not your problem. The subject of the video is Bitcoin. So this guy, Robert Hertel Pool. Um, he's just curious opinions on it. I don't really like to opine on it because I don't have a. I didn't have a good metaphor for it or analogy, but I guess I can sort of explain it. Um, so the, the first thing people ought to understand is to, there's two things: a currency and a, a commodity, or two different things. Some commodities you can use as currencies. That would be like gold as an example. They inflate in price, but they are a commodity. They do have some sort of intrinsic value. They're just not paper with printing on it. And other things can be made for the explicit purpose of just being for transactions. They're not intended to have value beyond their function as, as exchange currency. And that's sort of what dollars are. Is they're intended to be just something you use for transactions, not something you hoard. So when you make something for the deliberate purpose of enabling people to do transactions, you want it to sort of depreciate in value, not appreciate in value. Because if your currency appreciates in value, that's you know people start hoarding it, hoard, hoarding it. Well, yeah, then it increases in value, and it, you know you're just stuck with a bunch of fluctuations in price. And in a sense, Bitcoin's purpose was to just be a transaction currency. So maybe they didn't think about it, but I think they did because of the way they engineered it, that they were going to pyramid scheme it a little. You know, that they could create a mechanism like gold that would be used for transactions and they could control how much of the resource existed. So by controlling how much existed, they could control price and therefore control profit. So, you know, but uh, who cares what the malicious intent are? But the basic idea of what Bitcoin was facilitating was it was essentially creating some, taking advantage of the virtual space, you know, internet space. And the idea that theoretically it'd be very nice if I could just pay my bills by, like if I had a bunch of slots here, and I could just put the stuff in a slot, you know, in a, in a place, in a box. And then somebody else across the world, you know, or even at the, you know, Verizon or whatever company I'm paying, and they could just pull it out of the slot where they are. And so the internet sort of gives you that ability. You can just stick something in a place on the internet, you know, in one side, like one, like a, two, a mailbox with two doors on it. You can put the stuff in one door, and they can take it out the other door. And that's sort of what Bitcoin was supposed to be, was some sort of, you know, non... It was supposed to be just a, a machine that would take care of that, you know, a mechanism. So there would be no government or no business or no anything that was supposed to be screwing with you. It was just going to be this mechanism you could go to where you could put stuff in and somebody else could take it out. But the stuff had to be converted into something in a sense. So the Bitcoin you could look at as just being the slot. But there had to be something to make sure what you put in the slot was something. So you can't just make slots with nothing in them and call it a Bitcoin. So, so that's the, the, the gimmick of it, is, is that we, you know, instead of having a mechanism where you could put something reliable in the slot, like access to your bank account, <laughs> um, um, you have to transfer it into a currency or something the other side's going to say is valid to it. So, it 
<clears throat> kind of fails in the sense that you have to have these brokers or you know some authority at least on one side of the Bitcoin who makes sure when you buy a Bitcoin you actually paid for it so there has to be some sort of authority on the one side that says I'll make sure everything in a slot is something so nobody can claim they got ripped off and all that kind of stuff because there's nothing in the slot when they pull what they're supposed to be pulling out of it out of it um, so I guess that's the, the, the catch of the bit, Bitcoin is just that there was you know to, to make it possible to be sure there was something in the slot you have to make it possible for people to access this stuff and that you know the register and all this other stuff and then somebody can hack that or break that or ruin that and that's why the thing crashes but I guess the the, the limiting factor is always going to be this idea of a broker and so you know until you have some sort of real Bitcoin currency like some sort of broker or some kind of bank that actually creates reliable slots like something where um, there's some sort of so what's the right word for it some way to have insurance you know you need some I guess you need what all oh, I'm saying I guess you need more you need you need more infrastructure to guarantee that yeah your Bitcoin doesn't disappear because basically you are paying for it with real money and then the the, the creation of it is is establishing some sort of guarantee but I mean obviously some broker or somebody has to make sure they have the, the bit the, the coin to cover the bit I mean it's still going to be still going to need coin in the slot the slots are still going to have to have something in them reliable and that has to be somebody's name who's going to be accountable for the money so the buying broker's name is going to be on all these slips, you know, and essentially. So that's all you're really buying is you're buying your broker's, a, a broker's IOU. And if the broker decides to skip town, you're out of luck. Yeah. Or if somebody hacks the broker, you're out of luck. Um, so anyway, I just don't, I don't see any real value in creating an artificial mechanism especially one like if I was to do Bitcoin if you was to do it in some honest way I wouldn't limit the number of bitcoins um, I would make them all self-destruct once they completed their task because essentially that's what they're for they're for transactions that's what the whole thing was invented for was to move um, money from one place to another place um, you know, without having to go through the regular banking system directly, so you'd have an intermediary stuck in the middle doing the transactions. Um, but that, I mean, that's really all it's for. And there'd be something, like I said, I see an advantage in having something besides PayPal because they're taking way too big a percentage for the, the minor service they offer. So, I mean, people who want to guarantee. They, they, you know, they have a guarantee of essentially having the money for the transaction. They should, there should be a free way for them to exchange electronically assets, um, you know, based on the fact that they are prepaying, essentially. So I guess that, you know, that would be the, part of the reason why I guess you had to actually purchase the Bitcoins is to establish the fact that you actually had the money. But again, that's the failing of it because once you now create this synthetic entity, um, you still have to have record keeping of some kind, and wherever the it doesn't matter where the records are, you know nothing's immune, um, you know, to somebody who knows how it's where it's being held. I mean, you know, it should theoretically it can be immune, I suppose, just in the sense that the slots are, you know where it's you have some guarantee that only through a certain process could somebody possibly open the door I mean I have to give them the code or they can't open the safe and the internet can provide pretty secure vaults that way it's just they didn't do it in this example obviously they didn't secure the vaults the boxes um, so anyway so yeah but this whole idea of you know I mean his, his video is more about um, you know this whole conspiracy theories people have about currencies and and 
I, I don't see any value in multiple currencies. I don't see any value in any of this crap. <laughs> they're, they're not. I don't see any value in gold. I don't see any value in putting, um, establishing um, non-real commodities as um, something you sleep on. I mean, really, if if you want to buy something to sleep on, that is something you you're, you know a hedge against inflation. Well, then buy something that has actual value. You know, buy a bunch of swords or buy Twinkies or, you know, something else that's durable that you can put under your bed and sleep on. Um, but if you think some kind of currency is going to be indestructible or immune, um, well, that's bullshit. And if you want to just play some idiotic game like I'm going to try to buy low and sucker somebody at a high price, well, go ahead, but that's just gambling and what's the point of that? Why don't you just steal your neighbor's money overtly? I mean, who wants to, I, I don't see any purpose in playing a game where that's zero sum. That for every winner there's a loser. What's the point? So, um, yeah, so I, I guess that's all I, I need to say on the subject. I don't think a Bitcoin should have any any value. It's, it's completely arbitrary. I guess that's the other point people don't understand is it didn't matter what the Bitcoin value was to its usefulness. Whether a Bitcoin cost $300 or $200 or $700 or $1,000 is totally irrelevant if all I wanted to do was use it for a few microseconds to transfer money from one bank account to another. So if all I'm trying to do is transfer money, it doesn't matter what I pay because the price won't change while the transaction takes place. So, I, you know, if I pay $1,000 per Bitcoin, I get my bitcoins and then 10 seconds later I cash them out in Zurich. They're going to cash out at the same price I bought them at. So it's not going to matter about any change in price and I successfully transferred the money. So as a transfer currency, the price of the bitcoin is irrelevant. But this theft thing just makes, you know, the theft of people who are basically buying it as they were buying it as a commodity. And then they had a whole system for vaulting it, you know, where you could take it offline, so to speak. And I think that's the system that broke down. And that just ends up creating paper that you have to file to get your coin back. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's the whole stupidity of it is that it had two systems built into it. And one of them was a system for people who were speculating and one of them was a system for transfer. So, if they would have just left it a transfer coin, that makes much more sense. And for a transfer coin, though, obviously you wouldn't have a mechanism where brokers make their money by making more coins. That's kind of bullshit. And then have some limit on how many coins can be made in the end anyway to keep the price going up. So, I mean, they turned it into a commodity. So they took a perfectly rational transition, you know, a perfectly rational way to to transfer money and they turned it into some idiotic speculators game to play so yeah but I mean eventually there's going to be uh, something somebody's going to do it right and we'll just have some simpler way to transfer money from one bank account to another bank account whether it's for a purchase of a you know retail or whether it's you know, it doesn't, just doesn't matter. We just should be able to transfer money without paying 3% to credit card or, you know, 5% to credit card companies that are 3% to PayPal. I mean, their fees are fundamentally outrageous when they're secure transactions. That is, transactions from people who have more than enough money in the bank. I mean, it's almost something the banks themselves should have done by now, is create networks between them for secure transactions. And we should just be able to buy ourselves into the stream with a prepaid account that just enables us. It's like almost having like a prepaid credit credit card that's good at any retailer who's part of the network. And then all this should just be computers are doing it, software should just do it. This isn't, yeah. But we live in a, a shysterocracy, and so uh, the shysters have to steal our money. Because apparently everybody likes liars and cheaters. That's the world they want to live in. <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe Hans. Guess it's a good job if you can get it. But you know, I wouldn't take it. It's kind of like honor and integrity. Anyway, till next time. So, tired still. Uh, I wonder if Piero got to main. Okay. I haven't heard anything yet. Anyway, till next time. The cats are waiting. Anyway, that's going to be rough on the cats. They don't like moving. So anyway, till next time.